What if the premise of Mass Effect Andromeda was an ingenious loophole to fix the crazy choices we made in Mass Effect 3? Crazy choices like using or sabotaging the Genophage Cure, or choosing the Geth over the Quarians, the Quarians over the Geth, or saving both races. I have a theory that Andromeda, in part, was built to resolve these types of contradicting choices, and ultimately to set up an eventual return to the Milky Way, like the next Mass Effect has been hinting at. Before we get to the genius of Andromeda's premise, let's take a look at why the Mass Effect team was forced to leave the Milky Way following the events of Mass Effect 3. Mass Effect 3's priority missions on Tuchanka and Rannoch had the most galaxy-altering choices in the entire series. On Tuchanka, we chose to either cure the Genophage or sabotage the cure, and on Rannoch, we were given a final ultimatum for a centuries-long war. Either choose the Geth side, the Quarian side, or both. In both missions, because of the gravity of wrapping up two major plot threads teased since Mass Effect 1, it rightfully resulted in two of the biggest galaxy-altering consequences in the entire series. But the problem with giving us players these choices was that it made making a sequel in the Milky Way virtually impossible. For example, if you cure the Genophage, a sequel in the Milky Way will have Krogan galore, but if you sabotage the cure, there'll barely be a handful of Krogan around. For the Geth and Quarian War, the decision was even more problematic. Choose the Geth side and you lose all of the Quarians, choose the Quarian side and you lose all of the Geth, or have both races survive. I'll touch on the craziest choice we were allowed to make, which ending we chose in Mass Effect 3, near the end of the video. The galaxy-altering choices we made, like how we dealt with the Genophage and the Geth War, significantly handcuffed the Mass Effect team's storytelling ability in a Milky Way sequel. There were simply too many iterations of contradicting choices to wrangle for each playthrough. So if the Milky Way is broken from our countless iterations of choices, then why do the teases from the next Mass Effect clearly point to a return there? The teaser trailer from 2020 directly zooms into it, and multiple pictures of concept art showcase buildings that are reminiscent of places like Ilium, Thessia, and Omega. So what's changed between the end of Mass Effect 3 and now? Why has the Mass Effect team had a sudden change of heart to willingly return to the galaxy where our choices have wrecked havoc? I think it's because they perfectly crafted Andromeda's premise as the solution to set up an eventual return to the Milky Way. And this ingenious solution very closely mirrors the solution to the first race-altering choice we made back in Mass Effect 1, what we did with the Rachnite Queen. During the Novaria mission in Mass Effect 1, we were given a choice to either save or kill the Rachnite Queen, thus either saving the Rachni race or dooming them to extinction. The Mass Effect team could have decided that these two choices were too contradicting to resolve, and simply canonized one, but instead they developed a genius strategy that allowed for the Rachni story to continue into Mass Effect 3, while still honoring the choice we made on Novaria. To help explain how the ripple effect for the Novaria choice works, I'll use an example of two different playthroughs where player A saved the Rachni Queen on Novaria, and player B killed her. The ripple effect from the Novaria choice is directly seen during Aralak Company's mission in Mass Effect 3. There are two different Rachni Queens the players can encounter, depending on their specific choice from Novaria. Player A, who saved the Rachni Queen, encounters the same queen again, but player B, who chose to kill the Novaria Queen, encounters a mirrored version of her, a breeder queen made by the Reapers. For both players, there isn't any significant consequential difference if their particular queens die, but here's the beauty of the consequences for letting their queens live. If player A chooses to release the original Novaria queen again, she becomes a very valuable war asset who will be loyal to that player. But if player B releases the Rachni queen breeder, it results in her betraying them down the line, harming their overall war assets. Because Player B chose to kill the original Novaria Queen in Mass Effect 1, it impacts their ability to effectively build the Crucible in Mass Effect 3, a pretty dire consequence. So the Mass Effect team's genius strategy for resolving race-altering choices is actually pretty simple. Mirror the original choice where the race survives, with differing consequences down the line, depending on what choice the players individually made. With the example from before, the breeder Rachni Queen mirrored the original Novaria Queen, but had a negative outcome for player B, 
because they chose to kill the Noveria Queen in Mass Effect 1. From a development standpoint, this strategy is very efficient. Otherwise, the team would have had to create a separate version of the Aralak mission, changing the story and thus creating vastly different experiences for both players. But luckily, and very smartly, they devised this brilliant blueprint for how to resolve a race-altering decision, resulting in both the continuation of the Rachni story and each player feeling the consequences of their original Noveria decision. And the best part about this blueprint is that it was probably intentionally used in Mass Effect Andromeda to once again create race-specific stories within the Milky Way. Before I get to how, just a quick note that next week's video is going to cover a mind-blowing discovery on Aya that might just reveal the Jardans' true identities. So make sure to subscribe if you'd like to catch that one. All right, back to the blueprint. How can the Genophage and Geth War's many iterations of choices be resolved using this same genius blueprint? To see how the blueprint has probably already been put into action with Andromeda, let's first look at the decision we made on Rannoch, once again using an example of different playthroughs. Player A chose the Quarian side, Player B chose the Geth side, and Player C chose both. Now let's apply the blueprint to resolve this contradiction between all of the choices, by mirroring the choice where the majority of races survive. In this case, Player C's choice where both the Quarians and Geth survive is the easiest to mirror compared to Player A and B's playthroughs where only one race survives. But wait, how the heck can Player C's choice be mirrored in the other two playthroughs? Either all the Quarians or all the Geth get wiped out. So there's no Quarians and Geth lying around to mirror the originals. Or is there? Enter the absolute genius of Mass Effect Andromeda's premise, specifically the Initiative's arcs. The Initiative's arcs took a portion of every prominent Milky Way species and shipped them off to the Andromeda galaxy, including a portion of Quarians on the Kilasea. These Ark Quarians could be mirrors of the original Quarians, thus replacing those who were killed by Player B. Now while the Geth weren't included on the Initiative's arcs, in the Mass Effect comic Discovery, it goes over how a Geth Enclave used an FTL telescope to look beyond the Milky Way, for some unknown purpose. I go into it more in depth in my previous video, but I believe it's likely that a portion of Geth left the Milky Way as a result of this, so there's potentially a way to mirror the original Geth player A killed on Rannoch. So that's the mirroring portion of the blueprint taken care of, but what about the consequences? I'll go over those in a bit, because it's the same consequences that'll apply to how the Genophage contradiction can be resolved. The different playthroughs of the Genophage decision were as follows. Player A chose to cure the Genophage, and Player B chose to sabotage the cure. Applying the blueprint once again, the easier decision to mirror that results in saving the Krogan is Player A's decision to cure the Genophage. And once again, Mass Effect Andromeda provides not one, but two examples of how the cure itself will be mirrored. The Nexus specifically shipped off with the Nakmor clan Krogan, who just so happened to possess the highest natural resistance to the Genophage out of all the Krogan clans. Over the 600 years that the Nakmor clan traveled to Andromeda, the Nakmor clan's genophage-busting mutation continued to develop, resulting in a whopping 4,000% increase in fertility, according to Nakmor Kesh. On top of that, there's even more genophage cure mirroring in the mission to save Dr. O'Kir's Krogan research. For those that need a refresher, Dr. O'Kir was the Krogan who bred Grunt in a tank in Mass Effect 2, and the Mass Effect team just so happened to decide that Dr. O'Kir's research on Krogan physiology and the genophage will be available in the Helios Cluster for players to retrieve. To me, Dr. O'Kir's research in this mission mirrors Malin's research on the genophage, which was an integral part to curing the genophage on Tuchanka. So with the Nakmor Krogan able to produce at a 4,000 fertility rate, plus Dr. O'Kir's research, there's a way to mirror the choice of curing the genophage that matches Player A's decision. Using the same blueprint that resolved the Rachni choice we made on Novaria, the Andromeda Initiative's arcs and comics have provided a small glimpse into why we're starting to see hints of a return to the Milky Way. And the beauty of this is that if they do return, the potential for creating Krogan, Quarian, and Geth stories 
will once again be available to the Mass Effect team, with consequences for every choice players made on Tuchanka and Rannoch. Hypothetically, the consequences for curing the Genophage could result in Player A running into a friendly Tuchanka Krogan on the Citadel, because they know the player helped save their race from infertility. But Player B, who sabotaged the Genophage, could run into a Knackmore Krogan, who would definitely be less than friendly, maybe even resulting in a headbutt or two. During a Quarian-specific mission, Player A could meet a Quarian from Rannoch who'd have friendly dialogue since the player helped save their homeworld. But Player B, who chose the Geth side, could meet a Kila Sia Quarian that probably wants to blast their helmet off before throwing them out an airlock. In this way, the Mass Effect team wouldn't have to create multiple iterations of what the Citadel would look like, or countless race-specific missions. They can simply replace the model and dialogue of the affected races, resulting in a unique experience for every player. Andromeda's premise perfectly sets up the next Mass Effect taking place in the Milky Way, but of course this can only happen if it's what the Mass Effect team intended, because as with all my videos like this, this is just a theory. And obviously, the biggest elephant in the room is that none of these solutions for the Genophage or Geth War will matter if the Mass Effect team can't resolve the biggest galaxy-altering decision in the entire series. The endings of Mass Effect 3. But I think the way to resolve the endings is using an entirely different blueprint, which I'll cover in a future video. Now, how exactly the Andromeda Initiative's races will return to the Milky Way is the biggest question that we don't yet know the answer to. However, there's no way to practically storytell in the Milky Way if the crazy choices we made in Mass Effect 3 aren't resolved, and the Initiative's arcs are the perfect solution that matches the way they resolved the Rachni decision. So in my opinion, the real question isn't if the Initiative's people will return, but how? And I provide my best theory on how the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies will connect in this video right over here. See you there.